Hello, everybody. I get to do something that I absolutely love to do, which is to spend some time with one of my favorite people, Mirabai Star. And we're having the chance to talk about something that Mirabai is about to present, something wonderful. It's a free opening to unraveling the myths of grief. We're living in a time where grief is everywhere, and we're living in a time when it's very hard not to be in a state of great grief at what's erupting everywhere. And what we most need is, I believe, permission to grieve and a mission to tap down into the deep levels of grief that our love for the world inevitably opens up. I can't think of anybody more skilled and more nuanced and more subtle to help us into this way of grieving fertilely and rejoicingly than Mirabasta. So, darling, what are you planning to do with this wonderful free offering? Well, I love how immediately you landed on the paradox, you know, and it doesn't surprise me knowing you. My darling Andrew. Paradox is our ground, isn't it? That's our love language. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so it it's uh, exactly what you said, that somehow by approaching grief with our arms open, what is has previously only been sorrowful, or maybe we were only allowed to be sad, opens itself up into a much bigger landscape. Uh, that includes joy. In fact, it feels so liberating when we're finally allowed to feel our feelings fully and express them, especially in community. So what we're up to is that we're offering a free four-day kind of um, oasis in the desert or a campfire in the wilderness where people can gather for one hour a day, um, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, and take refuge in that circle of community where we're gonna be pulling on the threads of what society teaches us about how to grieve, how not to grieve, on what timetable, to what end. And one by one over these four days, dismantle them, unravel them, and reweave meaning as we navigate this path of grief that so many of us are on right now, both personally and collectively. What are these four themes that you're going to be diving into? Because it's we live in a very grief-phobic culture. Yes, we do. A culture that is terrified of the power of grief to expose the shadow, to expose injustice, to expose horror. And... We have so many voices attacking us, telling us to get over our grief and be positive and be cheerful, (laughs) which is part of a massive conspiracy to keep us stupid and unable to respond to the actual horror that's happening, let alone energize ourselves to act against it. So without accessing our grief in the most passionate and effective way, we really are left marooned in our sorrow and very easily tempted to press that sorrow down so it becomes depression and paralysis. So what you're doing is so important because you're guiding us into a way of grieving that energizes our whole being and connects us with divine love and also with our own power of sacred passion and that can lead to energizing us for action exactly i learned all this from you is that of course yes (laughs) your your sacred (laughs) activism is rooted in fully feeling but absolutely and it's so much easier to not uh, but it, it isn't actually easier to not that's oh, it the, isn't. You, you the die lie. inside. You go numb. You go paralyzed. You go depressed. <laughs> Learning how to grieve is one of the great, terrible gifts our time is giving us. So plunge in, my darling. Tell us about these four different permissions you're going to give us by unraveling the myths. Well, the first one is the myth that there's some right way to grieve and therefore a wrong way. 
and some timetable that you should be on like six that your your child died six months ago you're you're not over that yet it's it's monstrous the expectations society puts on us particularly on the individual level of losing a loved one to death or a, or a divorce or a breakup or and the loss of community that often goes with any particular mm-hmm. loss there are multiple losses within losses and sometimes we're just reeling from it all. So people telling us that, that that there are stages that we should be checking off the checklist and getting through um, by a certain time frame, and that if you're not, you're even more broken than you thought. This is a myth mm-hmm. for unraveling. Grief is individual and um, highly personal, and it's also a cycle. It's not a trajectory that no. you <laughs> circle back through each of these different kind of universal features, let's call it, in the landscape of loss that we share with the human family again and again. And each time we integrate more, but it's, a, as you say, Andrew, an ever-evolving adventure. That yes. We're really approaching grief as an adventure, as a spiritual path. Adventure may be not the word y'all are in the mood for right now if you're grieving, but let's call it a path, a journey, a voyage. It's, it's, um, unfolding and it keeps revealing new gifts and new insights and new challenges along the way. So the first myth is that there's a right and wrong way to grieve. I just wanted to say, I remember once after I'd lost one of my cats and you know how much I love my cats. One of my friends sweetly said, well, you know, get another one. Yes. Yeah. As if you could replace someone who had been your deepest soul companion it was it was really it was funny I, at least i laughed but good it's that good. attitude that is so fatal but there's something very dark in that attitude too mm. and i think it's worth exploring why people yes, in our people... culture are forbidden grief right because once you allow yourself to grieve you realize just how much is going so dreadfully and painfully and terrifyingly wrong in our world. And that opens you up to a clarity about cruelty and injustice, which the powers that be don't want you to have, because they know that as long as they keep you divorced from your grief, they also keep you divorced from your passion and from your righteous anger and from your intense will to see things transformed. So that that refusal of permission isn't just a, a cultural thing. It has a deep, dark purpose behind it, which we have to analyze. Does that make sense to you? I agree with you completely. Because what it does is it takes the it it strips away the the impediments to clear seeing. It's almost yes. like it's, it's almost like the opposite, I think, of what way people think of grief as being this dark cloud that descends on you and you can't experience life as it is. It's if it almost feels in my experience like the opposite. Grief is a fire that strips away the veils and then we can see clearly and people who see clearly are dangerous. In yes, this, in yes. And what you're doing really in this wonderful retreat is, is empowering people to become dangerous. Yes. Because if the, we claim the power of our grief, if we claim the clear eyes of our grief, if we claim the passion of our grief, if we unleash the truth that our grief connects us to, then we become rebels of love. Mm, precisely. Which leads mm. to day two. And the theme is that your grief is a burden. That's another myth that, that we often suffer from. So, oh, God, so on, yes. top, on top of grieving the loss of something that meant everything to you, then you're feeling like you can't actually lay this on anyone else because you walk around like this often people who are grieving like feel- a leper you're very you're shunned because of the intensity of your grief yes and so this is a space where people can be real and they yes. can lay it down yes. in a circle of other bereaved people and say yes this sucks i hate it you get to hate it uh, we're not saying that you should just find the joy in the grief and God, I, that's crazy new right. age garbage. You've got to allow people to find that in the way that uniquely love gives you, right? That's it. So on day two, we dismantle the grief 
I mean, the bur the myth that your grief is a burden to others. And we allow you to just have a safe place to feel it. Um, and to recognize- Sorry, Diane, sorry, I'm getting so no, excited no, because I love this. It. It's, no, it's, I think what you're doing is so profound because one of the things that's very hard now for all of us who are in connection with the Global Dark Knight who realize that this is an extinction crisis is that our grief pulls other people. Our grief makes other people want to silence us or want to abandon us because... They are genuinely, for many good reasons, extremely scared of feeling what we are showing. So what's needed is what exactly you are doing, which is providing an oasis for those who are in connection with their grief to experience it as sane and not crazy, as beautiful and potentially holy, rather than a terrible burden on other people who want to live in total denial of the world burning to death, potentially, on our watch. Yes, yes, exactly. And that leads beautifully. It's almost like you read my little mind. Oh, that I do. But you know we do this. We, do. We, do. <laughs> we inhabit each other's minds and souls, darling. So, so easily, so adept, adroitly. Um, so day three of the four is unraveling the myth that spiritual people don't grieve and oh. the, this ridiculous uh, notion uh, that to be sorry, spiritual, I'm, I'm so i know this, this is your song that yeah, this is my song friends, you're you're supposed to be so happy and cheerful all the time so when the elephants are dying every 60 minutes we don't grieve because we're totally away this is madness isn't it we've transcended our our pes pesky little feelings uh. Yes. We dwell in the non-dual land where nothing, nothing is wrong. And that's such garbage, isn't it? Because the reality of the mystical path is that when your heart, your sacred divine heart is open, you are open to much greater ecstasy and joy and power than you ever imagined. But you are also now a cosmic heart that registers at the most profound level the suffering of the planet. You cannot worship the mother and not also have her heartbreak, her heartbreak at the destruction of life, at the mutilation of the human soul, and all the terrible, terrible things that are happening in the world, at the genocide in Gaza. How can you be an authentic mystic without also allowing your heart to expand so much that it not only tastes ecstasy, but tastes the agony of the mother's sublime love for her creation? Beautifully said, Andrew. Don't you think so? This is the great fallacy at the heart of all of these patriarchal visions of enlightenment. Yes, and I think I mean I try not to use the word overuse the word patriarchy, but there is um there does seem to be truth to a paradigm that is dominated by a kind of hyper masculinity that oh, infects yes. every aspect of the human community from politics and uh to religion and spirituality and even when we think that we're we're in alternative spiritual spaces that are free from this kind of conditioning we often it's there. it goes okay. so deep look you are one of our leading pioneers and expresses of the sacred feminine and you know that one of the reasons why the religions and the mystical traditions have developed in the way they have is because the sacred feminine is messy, is passionate, is complex, ambiguous, it isn't something that can be controlled, it can only be adored and learned from. And the whole of a great deal of patriarchal religion and religious authority has been a rejection of the feminine, a rejection of that messiness in favor of a perfectionism which is dead, dead to the pain and the beauty and the agony and the ecstasy of real life. And that's her. That's what she's bringing back to help us truly relate to what we're going through and then find her courage and passion within us to do something real about it. Beautiful, Andrew. Exactly. Does that, make, does that ring true to you? It rings exactly true to me. And that is where the personal and the global merge. You know, when we recognize 
ourselves and each other. And that not despite our great losses, but through the fiery gate of heartbreak is when we discover that we belong to each other and that this that it is impossible for me as a bereaved mother to not take my place in the net of mothers everywhere every right. morning waking up wondering which mothers in gaza are feeling are what you felt yes 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 and it maybe if i hadn't lost a child I would still grieve just as hard as I am for the mothers I will never know who are thousands of miles away. But there is a special opening that that happened when my heart shattered with a very personal loss that enabled the pain of the world to come flowing in to my broken, open mother heart. And all of you who are listening have your own versions. Oh, gosh, yes. Shattering personal loss that... In, you didn't turn away from, but instead made the brave and perhaps very tentative decision to be present for, to show up for. And through that turning up, you are able to connect with your place in the in the net of interbeing and feel what you're saying is the world. What you're and really doing in this third it. in this third myth is that you're you're not only fighting against the deadness and paralysis of the heart that an addiction to transcendence gives us, you're also reframing heartbreak, not as something to be terrified of, but as an initiation into the great cosmic heart of the divine feminine, hmm. the great heart of the mother. Yes. Exactly. My heartbreaks have not paralyzed me. They have expanded my heart to be able to feel something of her great passion for life. And that has made me dedicate my life to really trying to awaken that passion so that from it a whole new world can be created. If well, we continue yeah. to... to be to have this myth that grieving is unenlightened, we will never get to the true mother consciousness, the true sacred marriage. We will never be divine human beings of great sensitivity, willingness, and willingness to feel everything and then react to it in ways that transform the situation. We'll never get to that power. So grief, heartbreak is an initiation into the heart of the mother, but it's also an initiation into the massive power of sacred passion that heartbreak can awaken. And with that passion burning in every part of ourselves, we can do tremendous transformatory things. Well, and that's and that leads into the fourth myth that somehow what happened to you is the end of the story. You know, this this is your life now is that you are just going to carry this secret burden of grief, like some some disease that that needs to be cured. But somehow you're doing it wrong because it doesn't go away. So the idea, the last myth is that loss is the end of the story versus actually the beginning of a new spiritual path, a new spiritual journey that you enter uh, willingly, with courage, with a sense of humor and irony, and perhaps irreverence, even, you know, that kind of spiritual path that is not pious and is not um, confined by some external set of, of rules or guidelines or beliefs or belief systems, but is a wild path. And, a you're, wild. Kind of, and you're not alone because there are so many people who also have been broken open and are ready to navigate this, this wilderness in community and, and harnessing what happened to them as a way to be of service in the world. I love what just, I love the fact that you say wild, because again, I think that behind all these repressions of grief is a determination not to allow us to find this wildness. Because when we do, we're born into the fullest power of our individual divine human self. Yeah. Nobody can take away the power of your grief once you've discovered it. And once you've discovered how it can enwilden you, 
Mm-hmm. and make you unstoppably fierce and grand and powerful and passionate and tender in the pursuit of justice, then n- nobody will be able to tell you not to grieve. You'll discover how grief is one of the powers that truly gives you the most power and the most access to truth. Well, and Andrew, you are, of everyone I know, um, the most clear, lucid exemplar of the of that power that power of the broken open heart to affect po- change. I'm not going to even say positive change because it sounds too much like positive think the power of positive thinking, but to affect meaningful, sacred change in the world. So thank you. Thank you, Dan, for everything that you're doing. This is, this sounds absolutely wonderful. And I cannot urge enough all of you who are listening it's free so plunge in look what Mirabai is doing for us especially at this moment when we are all in such grief of what's happening in our country in america let's really use our grief to become empowered yes yes thank you so much andrew for sharing this with your people who are my people my great pleasure darling <laughs>